Hello folks, here we are at El Arish Airfield on the Sinai map and I'm about ready to take a flight in the F5E. We're going to talk about some uh, realism stuff. Uh, but before we go to the airplane, I'm over here at the barracks and we're going to go, uh, or I'm going to do some pre-flight planning. Uh, specifically, it's a, an unusually uh, heavy airplane, over 20,000 pounds. And uh, I've got a uh, um, pretty heavy load, uh, more than I normally would uh, would take. Uh, we've got um, two rocket pods on the outboard stations. We've got uh, two 150-gallon fuel tanks on the inboards and one 150-gallon tank on the center line. I also have uh, two AIM-9s on the wingtips and a full load of ammo in the nose of the airplane. So uh, in that pre-flight planning, we're going to have to take a look at uh, where the um, CG is now so that we can set the takeoff trim. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, fuel management with external tanks uh, like we have today. And also, uh, we're going to go over the toll data for takeoff. Now, told is uh, takeoff and landing data, but we're going to focus pretty much uh, on the takeoff portion of that. So we'll take a look at the charts and go through the numbers and figure it out. And then we're going to uh, review the startup procedure and some of the post-start uh, checks, and we'll, we'll go from there. So uh, today's temperature is about 15 degrees. It's a real nice day. And uh, we have a pretty long runway, uh, 9,800 feet. So both those things contribute to making this uh, a little easier than it could have been if it was much, uh, if we had a shorter runway and the temperature was higher. So uh, good news for the flight today. Okay, that's uh, all for now, and I'll uh, see you in the planning. Okay, folks, here we are at the pitch trim data that we're going to need to look through in order to determine what our pitch trim setting will be for taking off with this heavyweight airplane that I have. Um, we're going to start with a clean airplane and the configuration of this airplane here is full internal fuel, oil and hydraulic fluid for that flight, uh, a pilot with a chute, no ammo in the nose, and no missiles on the wingtip rails. So it's a kind of a basic configuration. It's also got JP4 fuel. Now the CG is going to be at uh, a little bit beyond 18% Mach. And what do I mean by that? The mean aerodynamic cord uh, is uh, kind of summarized here, but a cord line is the distance from the leading edge uh, of the wing to the trailing edge of the wing. Now engineers have devised this um, imaginary rectangular wing which has force vectors equivalent to the actual wing. And so they can use it, makes the math easier. So the mean aerodynamic cord is this kind of average cord length from the leading edge to the trailing edge of this rectangle. And it's measured from 0 to 100%. Um, uh, mean aerodynamic cord, essentially is the name of it. And the CG is measured along the center line of the airplane for a symmetrical airplane. Uh, this particular configuration has a CG of 15% Mach, whereas the, the basic configuration that we have here is uh, a little bit beyond 18% mean aerodynamic cord. So for this airplane, it would fall into this category here, aft of 18%, so we, we would use a 6 uh, uh, degree setting for our pitch trim, and that's what we would enter in the airplane. Okay, let's go on. Let's figure out what today's stuff is all about. Okay, this is the graph we're going to use, and this is the equation that helps lead our way through this graph. And these are the weights on today's aircraft. Uh, this represents the weight on both outboard pylons, this on both inboard pylons, and this on the uh, center line. And this is the cumulative weight, so 1194 would be just this. 3510 is uh, outboards plus inboards, and 4663 is all three outboard, inboard, and, and uh, center line. And that's what we do. We work our way through the graph, starting out with in outboards, then go to inboards, then go to center line, and we come up with an adjusted CG as a percent of MAC. Then we take that number, and we come down here, and we apply these two corrections to get the uh, 
um, corrected CG. Okay, and of course this corrected CG is in these bands, and that's how we determine the pitch trim. Okay, so let's uh, start out with this uh, initial point, the uh, index point, which is the aircraft gro gross weight um, um, as on the clean airplane. On this, uh, at this point here, notice that it's it's a, a little bit beyond 18. This is a little bit beyond 18. So this is the CG of that airplane. <clears throat> so now we apply the outboards. We come up the uh, parallel for the outboards to 1194. Then we use the parallel lines for the inboard, and we come to the cumulative total of 3510. And then we use the parallels for the center line to come down to the uh, cumulative for all three, 4663. And from that, we parallel out on these uh, um, percent MAC lines here, and we get to what, uh, let's just call it 18 and a half. Notice up here is the cumulative weight, and these are, this is the CG going aft, CG going forward. <clears throat> okay, now we have the adjusted CG as a percent of MAC, at, and we'll call it 18 and a half. Then we drop down here. Uh, when we have missiles on the rails and we correct it, and it kind of turns out it's about a plus 0.5%, um, and that takes us up to about 19% MAC. And then we drop down further, and uh, for a full ammo load way up there in the nose, and we have a minus 4 CG, which uh, moves it forward here, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So today's CG will be 15, which fits in this band, which gives us a pitch trim setting of 7. Okay, uh, let's move on. Okay, folks, this is going to be a quick review of how to transfer fuel when you have um, lots of external tanks. Um, looking at this graph, this is the external flow and this is the internal flow. And the fuel order, the way we transfer is we always go pylons first, then the center line, and then we auto balance. And what do I mean by that? Well, we don't want to transfer on the ground because, as you know, when we start up the uh, the jet, our internal fuel is full. And if we started transferring the pylons and there was a failure in the float switch that controls uh, transfer to the fuselage, if there's a failure there, then we could be venting uh, through the vent on the uh, vertical tail uh, onto the ground or down the outside of the airplane, that could be a fire hazard uh, as long as we're on the ground. Once we're airborne, it's no longer a fire hazard, but it is wasting fuel. So we usually want to build some room in the internal tanks in order to transfer the external fuel into it. And so we uh, begin the transfer once we're airborne and uh, once the internal fuel has built uh, a little bit of room and the rule of thumb is uh, when the left or forward tanks are below 1,700 pounds and the right aft tanks are below 2,300 pounds is when we'd want to turn on the pylon first. Now, realizing that there's about 2,000 pounds in the pylon, um, we realize that uh, we probably will end up refilling the internal tanks before the transfer of all that pylon fuel is completed. And so we may have to sort of manually manage that pylon toggle uh, to make sure that we don't vent fuel and waste it airborne. Now, if we have a wingman, hopefully he'll call us and tell us that it's venting. Um, but it also could be that uh, uh, well, we won't have a wingman. And so we're going to have to, once the internal tank gets full, switch off the pylon and then turn it back on again when we have enough room again, probably using these numbers a second time. Uh, in any case, when it come time, when, it, when, it, when they actually are empty, we'll get a light on the caution panel that says external tanks empty. And um, the normal correct procedure is to turn off that switch, the pylon switch, before we turn on the center line switch. And that's because if we leave, leave that switch on, uh, it leaves the light on, and if we have the center line now turned on, uh, we won't know that that light will already be on and won't come on, obviously, when the uh, center line is empty. So it kind of uh, you lose that 
that insight. And so the procedure is always to, uh, once the pylons are empty, uh, before we actually turn the switch off, we want to see a decrease in fuel in the external tanks and probably going all the way back to the 17 and 23 to build another hole for the centerline fuel. So, and then at that point, we turn the centerline fuel on and then wait until the, uh, that light comes on again, then we turn it off. And at that point, we want to auto balance. And then the uh, internal system will uh, uh, essentially, first of all, it'll auto balance. So the uh, left and right tanks will be somewhat equivalent. Uh, and you want to keep it within 200 pounds plus or minus of each other. Uh, if you don't auto balance, then it'll follow this dashed line and that could get uh, into a dangerously aft CG. And so um, shortly after uh, the center line is empty, you want to uh, start the auto balance and it will, uh, first of all, tran or the fuel will match up. It'll get within auto balance range, I think of about 100 pounds, plus or minus a little bit. And that switch will automatically turn off. And then you just monitor the gauge to make sure it stays within 200 pounds of each other until the center line is empty. And then uh, um, it'll uh, transfer out of the uh, remaining uh, forward cell. And so that's essentially uh, keeping the CG pretty, pretty controlled. And that's pretty much how we do external transfer. Okay, folks, here we are at the uh, takeoff charts uh, as part of our pre-flight planning. Um, I'm going to go through these charts fairly quickly. So if you need to uh, uh, think about them, you can go ahead and stop the video and, and go into more detail. But And these are also available in the NATOF's manual. Um, first thing we want to determine is our takeoff speed. Um, and so we're going to come to this first chart. We enter this chart at gross weight, and our gross weight is 20,400 pounds. We come up to CG, which we now know is 15, and we come across and we get 172 knots. Now, aft stick speed is 10 knots less than uh, takeoff speed, so we that's 162 knots. And the only purpose of this is when we start programming this uh, the stick aft on, on our takeoff rule in order for the airplane to take off on its own at 172 knots. You don't want to jerk it off the runway. Okay, then we, we determine a takeoff factor, which we can use to apply for the remaining graphs here. And we determine that by going to this graph, and we start with today's temperature, which is 15 degrees C, and we'll come across from 15 degrees C to our elevation, which is 232 feet here at the airfield, just slightly above the single, the, uh, the uh, sea level line, come down to max thrust for afterburners, and we get a takeoff factor of 12. Looks like our uh, air defense guys are shooting off some missiles. Okay, then we'll come. We want to find how long it takes us or how, you know, the distance it takes us to, to get to 172 knots. And we're going to want to remember these two numbers when we determine our acceleration check speed. Um, so in any case, uh, 3,200 feet, we get that by coming in at takeoff factor of 12, coming over to gross weight, coming down to the wind line. We have a head knot wind of 10 knots. So we'll drop down to following the guidelines to 10 knots. We drop down through the CG line, which is at the base, coming right down to here, and that's 3,200 feet. So 3,200 feet is our ground run distance. Then we go to the next set of uh, charts. <coughs> Excuse me. And we get uh, the minimum safe single engine takeoff speed. And this is just a number we need to know. It's the speed that we have to get to if we lose an engine. Um, before we can take off safely, and that's just the minimum speed. So ideally, we'd want to use whatever runway we have to get as as fast, uh, as high a speed above 206 as we can. Other we're not, uh, otherwise we're in a pretty pretty extreme situation. So uh, minimum safe single uh, single engine speed is determined by 12, coming up to uh, our elevation, to gross weight, down to our CG line, over to gross weight again, and then down here we get 206. So that's our minimum safe single engine uh, takeoff speed. Now, we want to get uh, some other commodities for uh, if we have to abort and just to understand what's going on with the airplane. This is the critical field length and the critical engine failure speed. And they are sort of uh, entwined with one another. The definition of single engine takeoff speed 
is the the distance that we need to accelerate is the speed at which we can accelerate to on two engines experience an engine failure and either stop or take off in the critical field length distance so that's uh, an important commodity now uh, when we get to this chart uh, we'll we'll figure out we'll also figure our refusal speed and we'll talk about when we get there so let's get our critical field length first uh, 12 uh, gross weight winds down to 6600 feet here uh, hitting the baseline on both of these okay and then we come over to uh, um, critical engine failure speed again entering a takeoff factor we come up to gross weight and we come across to critical field length because that's what critical field critical engine failure speed is based on and you can see that here and so we drop down from there and we get 154 knots so that's the speed that we have to get to on two engines in order to be able to stop or take off in the same 206600 feet now <clears throat> Our refusal speed is based on our actual runway length. And so we take off factor, we come up to our gross weight, we come across to, in this case, we can only get to about 9,200 feet on this chart. So we drop down and we get to 190, kn 190 knots for our refusal speed, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense since we're going to be airborne by that time. Remember, our takeoff speed is 172 knots. So we could bring this back to 172 knots, but that even doesn't make sense because by this point, we're already programming aft stick into the... Uh, into the airplane and we're probably either airborne or close to it so I would choose as my refusal speed to use 162 knots okay now that's all both these are all with shoot with with a uh, drag chute uh, intending to be used so we don't really want to um, bet our life on it so let's just do this those same last two charts using uh, charts that uh, don't have the drag chute uh, so our critical field length, we do the same thing. We enter at 12, come across to gross weight, come down to the the uh, wind baseline, headwind for 10 knots, come down through the CG baseline, through the dry runway baseline, all the way down to the critical field length, which in this case is 7,400 feet. So this is our 74, our critical field length, not and not counting on the uh, on the drag chute, okay, of 7,400 feet. Now, our critical engine failure speed, also no shoot, 12 factor coming up to gross weight. All the way over to critical field length, now it's the 7400 field uh, critical length. And we come down and we get a speed of 146 knots, which is a little slower than the 154 knots we had previously. And that makes sense uh, uh, because we're not counting on the shoot. We're going to need to make that decision or, or that's going to have to be at a lower airspeed. So. 146 knots is the one that we're going to want to use, so we put that on our on our critical engine failure speed uh, on our kneeboard card. Okay, and then uh, the refusal speed for the same under under the same conditions would be 12 uh, factor of 12 gross weight coming over to runway length, and now we can actually get to the runway length of 9,800 feet. We drop down to refuse speed 172 knot. Now, that makes a little bit more sense. That's takeoff uh, speed. But again, we already, <clears throat> I, I would use aft stick speed instead just because um, by 172 knots, I may already be airborne. And then it comes real dicey. Okay. So those are the numbers that we use for takeoff. Now, one last number, and we, have to, we talked about it earlier, is the acceleration check speed. And we determine that by knowing what our takeoff speed is and the takeoff distance. So we know our takeoff distance is about 3,200 feet, and we come across to this point, and we come up from 172. And so we get this point, which determines uh, our guideline. And so we follow our guideline right along here to the point where at a, a marker, on the runway of 2,000 feet, the 2,000 foot marker, uh, we come across and our acceleration check speed would be about 140 knots. So we would put that uh, here, 140 knots. So we've got the numbers we need now for takeoff. And so let's, uh, let's go jump in the jet. Okay, here we are, folks, on the flight line in the F5E. And we're going to cover some realism stuff, similar to what I did in the A4 a couple of weeks ago. We're going to cover uh, ground ops and uh, the uh, toll data uh, verification on takeoff we'll do. 
and uh, we'll get airborne and start the transfer and then uh, we'll call it uh, call it a day for part one. Part two will be uh, getting some airborne stuff done including uh, using the armament switches with rockets and then uh, maybe uh, exercising the jettison system possibly and then we'll uh, come back and do some landing pattern work. Okay so here we sit in the F5E it's an old airplane, 50s, uh, 60s vintage, does not have an APU, does have a battery. Uh, we control air to the uh, engine via voice to the uh, crew chief, who will uh, hick or, uh, excuse me, uh, connect a hose. And, uh, uh, and then when we uh, ask him to apply air, he will. Um, the battery uh, means that we can uh, start this aircraft without using external power although we can use external power if we want if we want to maybe conserve the battery um, but we do require uh, external air now the battery gives us DC power and the igniters require 115 volt AC and so we need a static converter to convert the electricity to the proper type um, and it's because of that static inverter and what it actually powers that requires that we always start the left engine first. Uh, it powers the left EGT gauge, the left oil pressure gauge, the left fuel flow gauge. It also powers the left hydraulic gauge, which is the uh, utility hydraulics. It also powers through the fuel quantity and quantity check switch, the LOX gauge, and the fuel uh, quantity gauge. Um, the nozzle gauges uh, are also powered during start, and that's because they're DC powered directly from the battery. As uh, well, the RPM gauges also are powered uh, separately. They're powered pretty much directly uh, um, from the engine via some sort of electromechanical uh, connection. Um, I'd like to point out that the fuel gauge uh, has a left tank, which is actually the forward tanks, and the right tank, which is larger, and is the aft tanks. And as you can see, there's several hundred pounds difference between the two, and at some point, we, uh, we, uh, we, we have to auto-balance. Um, that will occur, um, uh, like we said in the, in the pre-brief, after the external uh, fuel has been transferred. And we won't go into more detail on that. Um, so we start the left engine first, and we get the air directly from the cart via voice command to the uh, crew chief. Uh, our role is in hitting the start button and bringing the throttle around the horn. We hit the start button about 10%, and it does two things for us. It um, starts the ignition timer, which lasts for 40 seconds. And it also um, arms the ignition circuit. It doesn't actually start the igniters. It just arms the circuit. Um, the throttle does two things. Uh, one is it, uh, it actually starts the igniter um, firing off. And it also dumps fuel into the combustion chamber. Uh, and that gives the engine the three things it needs, which is air, spark, and fuel. And therefore, the start will be on its way. Um, the 40 second timer has to do with a diverter valve and the diverter valve as the name implies diverts air to either the left or right engine. Now some airplanes have an automatic diverter, uh, others have a manual. I'm not entirely positive which one this has but uh, I believe it's manual so my assumption is that when the crew chief hooks up the air hose to the aircraft he has a wrench and he uses that wrench to turn the diverter valve towards the left engine. And then after we start the left engine, he will use that wrench to direct it to the right engine. Um, let's see. that. Uh, so what happens is when we hit the button, it starts the timer. We start the airplane. And at the end of that 40-second timer, the, air, the diverter valve goes back to neutral, cutting off air to either engine. And in the airplane, the real airplane, um, if you're watching the RPM gauge, when the timer times out, you'll see a drop in RPM of about one or two percent. Now, I don't think that's modeled here in the uh, in here in DCS. 
Okay, so I think I've covered everything about that I want to do. So let's go ahead and bring the checklist into this and we'll get started. First item is uh, takeoff CG, which we've already calculated at 15, uh, which equates to a trim setting of 7 degrees nose up. And we'll set that when we get power in the airplane and get to it in the checklist. Uh, we also, the first thing we want to do is kind of uh, start the, uh, uh, or turn on the beacon light. And that, let, that lets people know that we're either in the process of starting or that we have a running engine and for them to beware. Okay, uh, we'll turn on uh, four switches, two generator switches and two boost pumps. The left boost pump and the left generator are on the left AC system. And the right boost pump and the right generator are on the right AC system. The crossfeed valve is a DCS powered uh, uh, valve. DCS, I mean DC power valve. Okay, um, uh, so we got those on and we have those on. They're not doing anything right now because there's no power in the airplane. But uh, when we do get AC power um, uh, via the generators, then they all those things will be powered. And that's what we're looking for. Okay, go on with the checklist. Next thing is turning on the battery. And before I do, I want you to note that the AUX intake doors have a barber pole. That's because they're unpowered as soon as I put the uh, battery on. Since uh, both engines are not running, uh, the aux intakes, intake doors are closed. We just take a quick peek. Uh, it's the, the louvers just after the trailing edge of the flap. Uh, it's closed on the left side uh, and closed on the right side. Okay. Uh, so we got the battery on and we have lights on the caution warning panel which we will begin to take care of. Okay, anything else we need to do? I think that's it. Okay, connect air supply. Copy. Ground air supply is now connected. Okay, crew chief has diverted the air to the number one engine, so apply air. Copy. Okay, and it goes air is now applied. Directly into the engine, and I will hit the start button at 10 percent and I will come around the horn and we should get light off and there it is uh, we'll get a barber pole in the intake we got a RPM increasing EGT increasing oil pressure spiked and the fuel flow spiked and we'll watch the ET here real quick and it comes up it goes a little bit above 700 and comes down now it uh, that varies depending on daily conditions, temperature and uh, pressure and elevation and previous uh, uh, engine runnings of this aircraft. So, uh, And I've seen it uh, as high as uh, uh, over 800 actually. If it gets to 845, we are obligated to shut down the engine uh, due to the possibility of an over temp if it reaches 925. So we will watch that. Okay, the... Uh, um, the idle RPM is about 50%, and I'm sure that timer's uh, already expired, and I, I've never seen that at 1% to 2% drop, so we're going to assume that it, it's not modeled. Uh, for uh, EGT, all we need is an indication, and it looks like it's a little, a little less than 200. Okay, I think that's uh, all we need there. Notice that the oil pressure has um, come down. Now, in the for the first start of the day, the oil is pretty cold, and it's thick, it's it's very viscous, and when the engine is started and it starts getting some heat in there, it starts thinning out the oil, and now it 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 uh, the pressure starts coming down. And it's now within the idle range of five to twenty psi. Okay, and we've uh, killed the lights on the left side, so that it looks like the generator is doing its job. And let's go ahead and do the next thing. Okay. I'm sure the crew chief has now uh, diverted the air to number two. Apply air. Copy. Air is now applied. Okay, again at 10%. Hit the start button. Coming around the horn on the throttle. We get combustion. And the RPM starts coming up. EGT comes up. Uh, oil pressure spiked. Fuel flow spiked. And at 48%, we will get... Uh, the aux intake doors to open and uh, the engine will peak again and there's about 48% and there's the open doors 
and uh, it looks like the oil pressure is working its way down so everything looks normal on this start uh, let's just go ahead and take a quick peek at the aux intake stores and they are both open okay uh, a caution panel will check uh, the only thing remaining is the canopy and we're going to leave the canopy open for now uh, it's a nice day okay um, speed brake now we will close the speed brake now there is a speed brake elevator interconnect um, if I close the speed brake the trailing edge of the elevator should go up however it's not modeled here in DCS so I'm not going to go out and look at it but in the real airplane there is an interconnect and, and that's just so that when you close the uh, the speed brake or open it the elevator will adjust to minimize the amount of pitch change that uh, the pilot experiences or that the aircraft experiences when the uh, speed brake is uh, moved from one place to another. Okay, let's go ahead and set that. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and close it. Now, the, the speed brake is always open for pre-flight and that's done so that the uh, pilot and the crew chief can check the uh, Essentially, the pilot checks it on the on his pre-flight, and then after the engine is running and there's hydraulics on the airplane, specifically utility hydraulics, the crew, the crew chief can take a look at the uh, actuator and see if it's leaking. Okay, next thing is disconnect air supply. Copy. Ground air supply is now disconnected. Okay, uh, we don't need to drag that thing around the uh, tarmac. Okay, we'll go on to the next check, the post-star checklist. Uh, so we'll go ahead and turn the radios on so that we can talk to folks. Go to preset and we'll go to button 4. And then we'll also go to 51 on the TACAN because that's the local TACAN here at the field. And we'll go to receive for now uh, to warm up the box. Uh, cabin pressure, we want to make sure that that's in normal, and it is. And we do that because when we eventually do close the canopy, we want the canopy seal to inflate uh, so that uh, it, the canopy won't rattle as we taxi around or as we uh, take off. Yeah, I'm probably going to taxi with the canopy up, so it's primarily for takeoff. And then, of course, once we get airborne, if that uh, canopy seal doesn't inflate, then the uh, uh, cockpit won't pressurize properly. All right. Uh, all right, so the next thing is the oxygen uh, price check. So we'll, the P stands for pressure, so we'll check 50 to 120. And R is the regulator, so we'll make sure that's turned on. And when we do, we'll see a, an indication, which is the I, of uh, the blinker going uh, white and then black, and that's because I'm breathing. So it's, uh, it's sensing my uh, um, sucking in the air. And we'll check that in both 100% and in normal and I'll leave it in 100%. And the C is connection, so we just take a look at the primary hose and the emergency hose to make sure that the uh, all the connections are properly connected. Now, they don't look connected now, but they, in fact, would be in the real airplane. Okay, and the, and the last thing is the emergency, and there's actually several things on this. One is we uh, test, test the mask to make sure that we get continuous flow. And then we check the emergency position to make sure we get uh, continuous flow again. And then lastly, we uh, check the seat pan or the parachute, which we probably would have done on pre-flight for the emergency oxygen bottle, which is about 10 minutes worth of gaseous oxygen uh, at uh, 1,800 PSI pressure. So it's uh, a backup to the uh, normal oxygen system. Okay, all right, where do we go here? Uh, okay, next thing would be the generator crossover check. And then what we're doing here is taking a look at the uh, electrical system. We have two AC buses, a DC bus. Uh, uh, the static inverter, which is right here. And we have two transformer rectifiers, which change AC power to DC power. And that's the primary source that powers the DC bus. We have two of those, but we also have this uh, crossover circuit so that if we lose one generator, we'll get uh, a left to right 
or a right to left. So there's two separate circuits, circuits for the crossover that we want to check. Okay, we'll go back to the checklist. So the first thing we do is just turn off the right generator. Now that light will come on for either a generator failure or turning off the generator switch. So we know in this case it's the switch and since there are no other um, uh, items on there that are powered by the AC bus then we know there's a good crossover. So we'll just reset that and uh, turn the generator back on and then we turn the left um, generator off and the same thing. Okay, reset it and put it back on. So that's a good generator check. Now we'll check the two boost pumps and the cross feed. We know that uh, uh, with the cross feed off we have two essentially separate fuel systems. Each one has a boost pump providing about 9 psi of pressure to the system. Uh, when it fails the light will come on when the pressure drops below 6.5 psi. Now if, it, um, if I turn off the pump I should get the same result and I, what I'm going to do in this test is I'm going to run through the switches from left to right twice. The first time we'll turn off the first boost pump and that tells us that uh, um, the left system is below 6.5 psi and that the uh, um, cross feed valve is closed. Uh, now we're going to open the cross feed valve and that tells us that the cross feed valve is open because the right boost pump which is still operating is now pressurizing both systems. Then I turn the right boost pump off and I get both lights because we don't have any boost pumps and so there's no pressure on either system and uh, so we get both lights. Uh, it, it's inter interesting to note that we have two good run, running engines without the boost pumps. And according to the manual, uh, even in a maximum afterburner, this should be the case all the way up to 6,000 feet. And at mill power, all the way up to 25,000 feet and above 25,000 feet, they're all bets are off. So you run the risk of uh, losing an engine. Okay, so we'll just continue the test. So we start at the left end again. We turn the left boost pump on. And w since the cross feed valve is still open, we get pressure across both systems. And the left pump is strong enough to uh, pressurize both fuel systems. And that's a good test. So now we uh, turn off the cross feed to put the valve back where we want it for flight. And because we got the light in the right system, we know that the cross feed valve was closed. And we complete the test by just turning on the last boost pump. So we're back to the flying condition here. Okay. Uh, and now we're uh, going to go around and start turning on some switches. So we want to put the chaff in, uh, in flare in the single mode. We'll turn, off, turn on both the dampeners, the pitch and the yaw. Now the pitch dampener has some pretty awful uh, failure mode. So we want a quick way of turning off that uh, switch without having to look for it. So we have on the paddle switch on the stick, we click it and it drops the pitch off. And it's a good test, so I'm going to re reconnect it. Uh, now we want to turn on the radar to standby, which powers the antenna and keeps it from bouncing around as we taxi and take off and fly. Okay, and the next thing we want to do is uh, we want to check the flaps. So I'm going to move the handle first uh, to up, and we should get up. And I'm going to go all the way down to down, which should say full. And then uh, we'll go to the thumb switch position which is uh, indicates up because we're on the ground and the switch is in the position it's in, the forward position. So I'm going to use the thumb switch and go to the middle position and I should get fixed. And then I'm going to go to the aft position and it should say full. And that's the takeoff position. So um, essentially uh, thumb, thumb switch and auto aft uh, or auto full for takeoff on the flaps. Now I'm going to go outside and we're going to move the flap again because just like the speed brake there is an interconnect between the flaps and the elevator which we call the stab. So I'm going to go outside we'll take a look at it. This is modeled so when I move the, uh, the flaps to the up position using the thumb switch the trailing edge of the elevator should move up. And when I move the flaps back to full 
the trailing edge should move down and it does so that's a good test okay uh, the gun sight will go to MSL and that for now and that basically just checks the filament is working and that's uh, really all we need to do there later on uh, in this flight since we have rocket pods we'd be going to manual and setting a dipper set or a uh, depression angle okay the uh, ALR 87 uh, raw gear we're going to go ahead and turn that on and that uh, warns us if there's a surface air missile nearby or a bogey okay then uh, we've had 90 seconds or more so I'm going to go ahead and turn the TR to uh, uh, turn the tech into TR and then we'll do the pre-taxi checklist okay we want to um, uh, set the takeoff trim to 7 degrees nose up and that's based on the 15 percent of max CG that we have there 7 percent or, or 7 degrees okay then altimeter setting there is some hysteresis in this uh, in this uh, gauge so I'm going to move it around a little bit and then set 2982 there's 2985 2984 2983 2982 right there now the uh, altimeter setting should equal field elevation so we'll take a look at that field elevation is 232 and it just has to be within plus or minus 75 feet and it's well within that so that's good going back to the checklist okay uh, okay uh, and now the flight controls and this is a cooperative uh, test with the crew chief so I'd mentioned to the crew chief that we're going to do this check and he would follow along and uh, uh, he would use his, his hands to give me signals that I'm doing that he sees what I'm doing and we, we start with the front left then we go to the front right then we come back to the right uh, aft and then the left aft and then back to neutral and then we go left on the uh, uh, rudder and then right on the rudder and then we just do a follow-up with the front and back as I check the trim system cutoff. Okay, so that's uh, that's the that completes that check. Then we'll do uh, we'll set the transponder on, so we'll go to normal and we'll go to a setting of 1200, which is VFR, and that's what we're going to be doing today. Okay, that uh, completes the pre-taxi checklist. Now we're going to go ahead and taxi to the uh, to the runway. So we'll go ahead and add power and start our taxi. and I will see you at the runway okay folks here we are at the hold short of one six left and we're gonna pick up the checklist where we left off at the takeoff checklist so let's check the pitch and yaw adapter make sure they're still engaged and they are hydraulics should be between 28 and 32 and they are the aux intake door should be open they are the engine any ice is not needed so it's off now just a word on that if you require engine any ice just remember there's going to be a degradation uh, at mill of about nine percent and about uh, six and a half percent at max uh, full afterburner power um, the conditions that require any ice are um, between 10 degrees C and minus 25 degrees C and invisible moisture so we obviously don't have either one of those today but if you did you'd suffer those thrust losses at on takeoff so some people consider uh, turning the engine ice off for takeoff and then back on again once they get airborne that's a, a consideration but you want to make sure the conditions permit that okay then the taxi lining taxi light we want to go ahead and turn that on over here and then uh, light controls uh, quick wipe out making sure that there's no last minute binding here okay, they, they're good uh, and then uh, flaps should be still in uh, auto full and they are okay next is the lineup checklist so let's go ahead and uh, call for takeoff Tower, Cylon, Cylon 41, takeoff runway 16 left, VFR. Cylon 41, you are cleared for takeoff runway 16 left at El Arish Airfield. Copy. Cylon 41 is cleared to takeoff runway 16 left. 
Okay, let's go ahead and get the canopy closed. Okay, I'm going to push. Uh, canopy's locked, lights out, and I'm going to push up on the uh, canopy itself to make sure that it is in fact locked. And panel is clear, and we'll get the last two items once we're lined up here. I want to use uh, as much of this runway as I can. Okay, and make sure my nose gear is pointed down the runway. Okay, last two items are pitot heat, so let's go ahead and uh, turn that on. Okay, and then we want to hike the nose here, so let's go ahead and that switch. Okay, that raises our nose about 13 inches, or about uh, 3 degrees AOA. And it does the same thing as the ski jump does on a Russian carrier. It artificially raises the AOA, which effectively will reduce our takeoff distance. So that's a good thing. Okay, now that we've completed that checklist, I'm going to go to the uh, card here and take a look at the, the numbers here for takeoff. Now I have uh, the tires with flags in them to mark the one, two, three, four, and so on, thousand feet down the runway, and our acceleration speed check is uh, we should be at 140 knots if acceleration is is doing its job by the two board. So we're looking for uh, two flags and two tires, um, and then uh, right around 3,000 feet we want to. Uh, we should be getting 162 knots for the um, aft stick speed. And then at just about 3,200 feet, we should be reaching 172 knots, and the airplane should be lifting off, hopefully on its own. Okay, and then uh, uh, just to, to note, our critical engine failure speed is 146 knots, so that'll be our go to go speed today. And if I had another crew member, what I would brief is between uh, 0 and 100 knots, we would abort for just about any anomaly that we get. Above 100 knots and below 146, we will abort for serious but obvious things, things like loss of thrust, uh, engine failure, um, a engine fire, cat be coming off the airplane, some sort of directional control issue, uh, not counting a blown tire, and I'll talk about that in a second. So for any of those uh, obvious, um, sorry, of serious things, we will abort up to 146 knots. Once we're above 146 knots, we're a go airplane. We'll get airborne and we will deal with whatever we had uh, once we're airborne. Dodge four, airborne. Now the blown tire is a kind of a special case. It, it's uh, it can become very serious above 100 knots trying to do an abort with a blown tire. Taking off is much more uh, much safer. And so we'll just, uh, uh, above 100 knots with a blown tire, we will continue the takeoff, get airborne, deal with it, probably burn down, uh, maybe even get rid of some uh, ordnance and stuff on the, on the wings. But we will definitely uh, be lighter and we'll uh, be expecting, uh, we'll have a full runway and we can even land on uh, an appropriate side of the runway depending on which tire we blow. So those are our considerations. So let's just uh, summarize. 140 knots, then 162 should lift off by 172 at about 3,000 feet. Going to go 146. So let's go ahead and get out of here. OK, I'm going to set 90% first. And we'll check over the engine instruments. And one thing I want to note right away once I go to burner so I have to have the afterburner light within five seconds of going into afterburner. So we're going to look for some nozzle movement. Okay, so I'm going to go 100%, go into burner. We have two nozzles moving, so we've got good burner. Now we're looking for 140 knots, and the rudder is now effective. There's a hundred. There's a thousand feet. Coming up on 2,000 feet. There's 140 knots. We're good. Looking for 162. There's 162 programming it. And off we go. We're airborne. And we've got the gear coming. And we're going to turn off the taxi light. And those numbers look really good. Okay, looking at the aux intake doors, they should close any second. There they are. They're closed at about 255 as advertised. And we're going to go ahead and get rid of this uh, checklist here. Okay, and I'm trimming, trimming, trimming. 
coming out of burner and let's take a look at our fuel okay we are below 17 on the left and below 23 on the right so I'm going to go ahead and come on with the pylons and we'll start our transfer okay and we'd wait until uh, we burn down out of the uh, pylons uh, like we talked about in the brief until we get the external uh, um, tanks empty and once we got that light we'd uh, wait for a little bit more uh, drop in fuel quantity just to verify that it is in fact empty and then we turn the pylon switch off then we turn the, the center line um, switch on and we go through the whole thing one more time until we got the external light on but today we're not going to do that we're, uh, we're going to call it quits now so that's pretty much part one part two will involve uh, maybe some uh, airborne ordnance delivery and then coming back and doing the ladder pattern kind of stuff. So uh, I'm glad you, uh, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, thanks for sticking with me. And please subscribe.